It was supposed to be a national tourist centre. There was talk of five million visitors a year. But Derbyshire's Britannia theme park effectively lasted only two months. It was open before many of the attractions had even been installed. The customers stayed away, a receiver moved in. The legacy of this disastrous project is hundreds of creditors owed millions of pounds. Today, the police are engaged in the Midlands' biggest fraud investigation, an investigation into the rise and fall of Britannia. Britannia Park was one man's dream, this man's. Peter Kellard's base is Bournemouth, and until recently he operated four companies from the town. Kellard, a construction engineer by trade, is a determined, single-minded and persuasive businessman. He has huge ambitions in the rapidly expanding leisure industry, ambitions fueled by a successful model village project built by his company. But the collapse of Britannia Park has left him with acute financial problems. The cause of those problems is 250 miles from Bournemouth, here in South Derbyshire. This old mining site near Ilkeston should by now be a theme park. Kellard boasted that one day it would be the best in Britain, a park to rival the hugely successful Alton Towers. His project was supposed to be a joint venture with Derbyshire County Council, bringing jobs to an unemployment black spot. But Britannia Park was never completed and the customers never came in any numbers. The project and the partnership dissolved in bitter acrimony. The dream became a nightmare, and much of the blame, says Kellard, rests with the county council leader. Derbyshire County Council under David Bookbinder declared themselves to be, quote, hostile partners. That was bound to have its effect on negotiations. So it did have a major, it, it caused a major problem to the project. Are you saying that, that one individual was effectively able to sabotage your project? No, I'm not saying that one individual. The power that one individual exerted was able to do that. Councillor David Bookbinder is one of a new breed of Labour politician. Being the leader of Derbyshire County Council carries no salary, but he's yes, made it a full-time job nevertheless. This, um, he's even sold his business to ensure there are no distractions. In this county, it's this man who is in charge. Have we, are we still having... What time did he get home, do you reckon? Oh, midnight. Every day, the council's two most senior officers are summoned into his office. Bookbinder is fond of calling this the No Surprises Club, his way of ensuring that paid officials keep their political master fully informed of what's going on. But I'm also getting a little concerned about Britannia Park, what the current score is. There's rumours flying around with the fraud investigation now taking place. And as far as the fraud squad is concerned, because they've taken all our files now, and uh, that investigation is proceeding. In fact, I had them on to me today for some further information that they wanted. From the beginning, Bookbinder was one of the most outspoken critics of the Britannia Park project. The county council owned the land. He believed they were getting a poor deal, a deal his party had opposed. Bookbinder is also anxious to apportion blame. The fault, he says, lies with the developers. The downfall really came about because the park simply wasn't ready. Customers didn't come. It was undercapitalized, and there was also a great amount of um, undercurrent surrounding the park. People didn't have confidence in it. Bills weren't being paid. Workers, in many cases, were being abused there. So the county council's opposition at that time, I don't think, made any difference at all. It's this 350-acre site near Ilkeston that's the cause of the argument. When the coal board stopped mining here, an extensive land reclamation program began, and it passed into the hands of the county council. The area became known as Shipley Park, a popular place with walkers and picnickers. But the council believed it had greater potential. They wanted a theme park and a developer with private finance. Enter Peter Kellard, managing director of KLF. Here apparently was a man with ideas and money. It was 1978, the Conservatives were in control and they liked Kellard and his plans. We were very inspired by Peter Kellard because uh, he's a man brimming full with enthusiasm and we thought that this was the sort of developer that we wanted. That's why we awarded him the, the contract. 
A deal was eventually agreed in 1979. KLF were given a 90-year lease with an option to extend. In addition, the local authority agreed to provide the company with around a million pounds towards development costs. In return, the county council was to get a share of the rent paid by any businesses in the park and will be paid an annual rent of £135,000. This fixed for the entire period of the lease. We were very concerned that we should get a better price. The prices that were being offered the county council, quite frankly, were utterly ludicrous. It meant that there was a ground rent for 130 years, roughly, with no review at all during that period. And take into account that you were talking of inflation of in excess of 20%. That really was bad news for the ratepayers of Derbyshire. I think the council negotiated on very advantageous terms, but all contracts should be on the basis of mutual um, acceptability. And we felt that that was. But the balance of power in the council chamber was about to shift. Soon after the deal was signed, KLF's partnership with the county council became little more than a legal document. The 1981 local elections saw the Tories defeated and Labour sweep to power. It was in that Labour Party manifesto that we were not satisfied with the terms of that arrangement and that if Labour gained power, then we would look at the whole situation and reconsider the whole future of that part. And the result of that election was this. The Britannia Park project's most vociferous critic, Councillor David Bookbinder, was now running things. It meant that he and KLF's managing director, Peter Kellard, were partners, a business arrangement which neither relished. You couldn't have imagined two people who, uh, who, who fell out more than they did. Uh, they, they were like two opposing forces. Uh, uh, two element, elemental forces who were uh, reacted to each other immediately once they got into each other's presence and uh, as I say they uh, in, in a way they were two of a kind uh, uh, but set on different courses. The Britannia Park issue was now being perceived as bookbinder versus Kellard. The council leader wanted Derbyshire's contract with KLF renegotiated. It was a political priority and it was to become something of a personal crusade. He had the backing of his Labour group, but here was a man who led from the front, a man convinced the county was getting a poor deal. He's someone who finds it difficult to put his trust in anyone. All you've got to do is stay with me and you'll be all right. And stop talking to the other dogs as well. Bookbinder planned his strategy during long walks with his dog, delighting in telling people that here was the one creature on earth he could trust. I'll take your point, as you do. KLF's managing director was also finding it difficult trusting people and had resorted to secretly recording telephone conversations with Derbyshire officials, including the council leader. By now, tape machines had become an indispensable negotiating tool as relationships went from bad to worse. Bookbinder had one too and was secretly recording conversations with Kellard. Meanwhile, the park lay idle as the rows continued and building work was delayed for three years, years in which Kellard's company was unable to make any money. Eventually, in 1984, KLF sued the county council for nine alleged breaches of contract. They were successful on two. The judge took the view on the others, <coughs> excuse me, that the courts couldn't really interfere with the political process. Now, the ones that we did get were the ones that had the money locked into them. Well, it wasn't really successful at all, was it? He went, in fact, on nine different counts against the county council, and he succeeded on two rather minor points. And after that, that was sort of built up to some great drama. Both parties left the High Court firmly of the view that the balance of the judgment was in their favour. There were damages to be paid to KLF, but as there was no ruling on the amount, it left the protagonists free to speculate. Kellard claimed the court case would be worth £11 million to KLF. Bookbinder was advised it would cost Derbyshire County Council £5,000. But during the case, the judge had been prompted to make some comments about Kellard himself. Mr Justice Scott said, I regret to say that by the time he left the witness box, I had reached the conclusion that I had to approach his evidence with a good deal of caution. And there was more. 
The judge had some comments to make about your evidence. Mm. Do you remember what he said? Yes, he said he didn't believe me on, on one aspect of my evidence. Can, yes. can, I, can I remind you? I mean, I've got I, the I, quote I, here. I, I'll tell you what he said. Well, let, let me read it to you and, and get your reaction to it. He said, he said, Mr. Kellard gave in evidence the answers which he believed to suit KLF's case, mm. and without any real attempt to make his answers correspond with his actual recollection of events. He was wrong, but then he was entitled to be wrong because there was plenty of uh, uh, evidence in court that I'm sure he was wrong about. He appears to be calling you a liar. Yes, he was. Are you a liar? Um, I don't think so. No more than you or anybody else. The court case had clarified the legal position sufficiently to ensure that work on the park finally got underway. But with KLF working towards a summer 1985 opening, it was to become a race against time. And two days before that opening, only one man appeared convinced the race was being won. How confident are you that this is going to be a success? Not the slightest doubt. Has the thought of failure even entered your head? No. Nope. The band played, the sun shone, the Lord Lieutenant spoke, but the opening day was a disaster. Just saw a sea of mud and wasteland here, and it really is, as has already been said in the prayers, a great achievement of planning, of hard work, of enthusiasm, and there must have been a great deal of inspiration. In fact, the Lord Lieutenant's wife was later to become one of the creditors, owed £30,000. For now, though, the day continued in spectacular fashion, with a plane load of VIPs flown up from London in supersonic style. But they were to be quickly brought down to earth once they arrived at Britannia Park. In fact, their seats on Concord weren't paid for, and it was immediately obvious the park simply wasn't ready. Yeah, we're very happy with it all, and uh, we look forward to operating the park and developing it to its full potential. It isn't finished, though, is it? Well, it never will be finished. There's a £50 million investment. This is £18 million on the first phase, and things are happening, and they'll continue to happen to the indefinite future. And I, uh, if we give you an example of that, this country is always growing. This project will always grow. But the exhibition hall, one of the central parts of yeah. the whole theme park, is, yeah. is, is still not complete, is it? No, but there, there were, there's work going on in there at the moment, and it'll continue to go on, and then it'll open at the appropriate time. And in fact, the AV theatre will be open in just a couple of hours. But if I may say so, the park itself has an uncomplete air about it. There are still well, obvious signs if, of work if, going if, on. If, if that's what you think, why did you bother to come? Well, can I ask you if you're disappointed that it isn't finished? No, I'm not disappointed at all. Do you think the public will be disappointed? Well, we, if we all look at, in life at those things that we're unhappy with, we'll never get on with those things that we're happy with. And I'm happy with the lot today. And you just heard speeches that confirm that other people are too. And how do you see the prospects for the future? They're excellent, aren't they? You think it's going to be a success? Well, you know it is. They give all sorts of stories which turn out not to be the case. Today, for instance, we were told it was going to be a royal opening, and no disrespects to uh, Henry Cooper, but we were never aware that he was on the civil list. He may not be on the civil list, but Henry Cooper was soon to appear on the creditors list. Rumours were already circulating about the park being in financial trouble, but for now the efforts to keep it open continued, with Henry spearheading the advertising campaign. Training does get a bit boring. Especially when you could be having a much better time at Britannia Park. I mean, you've seen what they got in there. No wonder people are fighting to get in. Britannia Park between Nottingham and Derby is now open. Like my old left hook, it's a knockout. But the advertising campaign lacked any real punch. No one was fighting to get in. The debts were mounting, and only two months after the razzmatazz of the opening, a receiver was called in. He found those debts added up to millions of pounds, and that there was only one major asset which could be sold to pay them, the park itself. KLF had had around five and a half million pounds to spend, most of it borrowed, but the company had actually spent much more. No one knows exactly how much more, because the unpaid bills are still being calculated, 
but the receiver estimated that total debts amounted to more than nine million. We'd worked through the worst summer for weather for, for 20 years and the worst June for 50 years. Now that's from the Met Office. Now we'd worked through that situation and we were inevitably prejudiced and compromised as far as the 1986, uh, so, sorry, 1985 operating season was concerned. That's a matter of fact. Now you've got to take that in your stride and you've got to adjust to the circumstances. You don't say, right, we'll take the wickets away and we'll take a ball home and put a bat under our arm and toddle off. You have to get on with the job. Now, yes, it wasn't. As, as, it certainly wasn't what we wanted. But we knew that it was the springboard for something rather spectacular, and it certainly would have done the trick. But now it was a receiver who was running things. His responsibility was to the creditors. His job was to sell the park to the highest bidder and pay off as many of the debts as possible. The County Council and KLF were now competitors in the fight to buy it. Bookbinder took the line that it belonged to the people. At the local miners' welfare, he had guaranteed support for that view. Many of those here had worked at the site when Britannia Park was a colliery. The public yeah. not going to benefit some big enterprise. Kellard, meanwhile, was courting the creditors. His message was simple. Stick with me and you'll get your money back. I give you an absolute guarantee that the creditors of Britannia Park Limited, the unsecured creditors, will get their money back. How long will they have to wait? Well, it'll be progressive. Within three months, we'll be starting the scene, and within two and a half years, they will be complete. To this day, they haven't received a penny, and four months after Kellard made his promise, KLF's hopes of buying the park back ended. Madam Chair, at 8.38 last evening, this authority took over the running and control of Britannia Park and thus returned it to its rightful owner, the people of Darwin. <laughs> Derbyshire County Council paid a total of two and a half million pounds for the park. The deal included an end to KLF's outstanding legal claims against them. The breaches of contract, which Kellard had claimed were worth 11 million, were actually settled for 100,000. It meant that the 600 creditors were still owed a total of about five and a half million pounds. On that legal action, we've got the advice of our lawyers to... Kellard was furious. Down but not out, he and his associates immediately began planning to counterattack. Their case was, and is, that they had also made an offer to the receiver, an offer worth more than Derbyshire's. Why were you so determined to buy the park back, Mr. Kellard, after it went into receivership? Because we worked on something that was fundamental to us. It was something that we'd conceived, something we knew could be the best in Britain, and we wanted to make sure that creditors were taken out as we'd started the game, and that was why we were determined to buy it. Can you actually prove that you had the money available to buy that park back and you had a better offer on the table at the time Derbyshire County not, Council bought not it Not the slightest doubt. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Kellard, who we spoke to on many occasions and had a nine-month period in which to get his plans together, was never able to demonstrate throughout that entire period that he had any funds at his disposal at all. Kellard produced telexes to support his claim that he had the money to buy the park back. They mentioned funding from a Swiss bank, but don't mention which one. One of his advisers sent us a telex to say that a sum of 16 million Swiss francs was available. Um, when we challenged him um, merely to reveal who indeed this, this bank was, uh, he was not prepared to do so, and we were never able to discover what the conditions that um, they wished to impose were, uh, we couldn't satisfy ourselves indeed that there were any funds there. Our solicitor confirms that the money is available. Who was the money Con available Con from? I'm not telling you. Confirms can, you can you explain why you won't tell us? Yes, because they're working with us on other projects at the moment and they will be witnesses in the High Court case against, uh, against the bank. But while the claims and counterclaims continued, one of KLF's former employees had gone to the police. Peter Jones was the commercial manager at Britannia Park, responsible for arranging the finance. 
For several weeks now, he's been secretly helping the fraud squad. He says it was obvious the park was in financial trouble at least a month before it opens. No bills were being paid. Um, you know, the, the creditors were phoning up every day for money. No, nobody was getting paid. A lot of the construction hadn't been paid for. Um, this was one of the, the major problems, that uh, a lot of the construction that had taken place hadn't been paid for, and there was still an awful lot of construction still to be done. So, you know, there was no way that uh, progress could be made. Construction, in actual fact, was run down on the site um, instead of being increased to try and get it completed. Information Jones provided prompted Derbyshire's biggest ever fraud investigation, an investigation which the police say concerns the KLF group. It could last for two years and already extends throughout England, into Scotland, the Channel Islands and France. I think it was identified at a very early stage that this was an extremely complex inquiry and it would necessitate the, the manpowers and resources that we have now committed to it. You, you say it's complex. Well, why is it so complex? It's complex by the fact that the companies, whilst trading, generated an enormous amount of paper. Uh, that paper has to be examined, sifted, evaluated, uh, and any evidence which is found has to be uh, contained in a file which is eventually sent to the Crown Prosecutor. Britannia Park isn't Kellard's only financial problem. Back in Bournemouth, his KLF group of companies are no longer trading. The head office building has been sold. But even in 1979, the year Kellard was negotiating the park deal with the county council, business in this country was hardly booming. The local authority took up bank references, but didn't check the company has records. But you haven't got any of the overseas trading? Well, can you, off the top of your head, give me any idea of, 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 of overseas trading? I don't propose to tell you, because our overseas trading operation is the one that sustains us now. I feel that the County Council made an awful error early on. If they'd have examined the history of KLF, they'd have found that perhaps they would have discovered things that would have made them act a little less in haste than what they did at the time. Well, what went wrong was that... Um, the venture was set up as a partnership with two willing partners. And after we lost control, of course, there was one unwilling partner, which was the County Council, under its uh, new political control, for reasons best known to themselves, decided that they, they didn't like the contract and they wanted to break it. Uh, now, it was never going to be a success when there were, when there were two antagonistic partners. Simple as that. The real losers, of course, are the creditors. Among the 600 of them are two cousins who ran a small fencing business in Derbyshire. Like many others in the local community, Jeff Watton and Dave Routledge welcomed Britannia Park and the work it provided. Like many others, they were never paid. But while the larger businesses may have been able to write off their losses, fine fencing was financially destroyed. Jeff's mother is now trying to sell her house to pay off the cousin's debts of £5,000. In the meantime, they're having to make small repayments from their dole money. The job was they wanted a perimeter fence to it, plus a, a large screen, because they were still building while we were there. And uh, we only had a week, he said he only had a week to do it, Mr Callard. He says, no mind the cost or anything, just get it done. So that's what we did, we just cracked on with it. It took us two weeks to do, and then we didn't get paid. Mr Kellard says you're all going to get your money back. Well, I can't believe that. I mean, even the solicitor said forget it. There's, he owes, what, something like £8 million pound out? And I can't see who's going to back him to pay everybody up. He is a, a, a very plausible person. He was able to present a, an exceptionally good case for the project and uh, people believe what he said. Do you think people still believe what he says? I, no, I don't. I, mean, I do don't you... see how people can believe what he says. Did you believe what he said in the early stages? Yes, of course. Everybody believed what he said in the early stages, otherwise uh, you know, the project would never have got off the ground. What about your opinion of him now? I think that, uh, like a lot of other people, 
Uh, I'm a creditor, and like a lot of other people, we're rather better, and uh, feel that we've been badly misled. I think it's extremely unlikely that the creditors will get any of their money back. In Bournemouth, meanwhile, Kellard faces an uncertain future. He says he could earn a quarter of a million pounds a year by working abroad, but prefers to stay here because he feels an obligation to the creditors. He claims the sale of the park wasn't handled properly and is now planning to sue the receiver and the merchant bank involved. Writs have been issued but not served. And I made a total commitment to Britannia Park and I, I make a total commitment to everything I do. So, are you, you broke now? I'm broke now in the sense that everything I've got is geared to recovering some cash on this situation so that creditors can be paid. And I'll make a total, I've made a total commitment to that. And I'm working on other things and I make a total commitment to that, that too. But if you're saying to me, have I got large sums of money in the bank? The short answer is no. I have access to development capital. It's a different thing altogether. Uh, would you describe yourself as a wealthy man? No. Wealthy in ideas. I'm wealthy in ingenuity in the sense that make a project go, pick it up, and make it run. But I haven't been particularly clever in choosing my partners, and I should have got out of the Derbyshire project when I knew that Derbyshire County Council in May 1981 were not suitable bedfellows. In Derbyshire, Bookbinder is anxious to look forward rather than back. Today, the park is being redeveloped with his blessing. There's a new partnership now between Derbyshire County Council and Park Hall, part of the Granada Group. The local authority will have a big say in the way the parks run. Bookbinder is a man who likes to win, and after a six-year fight, he might perhaps consider himself the victor. I've never seen it as a battle in that sense of winning and losing. What we've always seen it as is an opportunity to develop a major area where there is great depression, and in doing this, what we've been able to achieve is that the county council is now playing a part in that. And are you satisfied that you have behaved quite properly throughout the whole saga? Absolutely. And given all the circumstances again, then I would have behaved in exactly the same way. Kellard's dream was a park with an educational theme, a park with less emphasis on the big thrill ride, a park with an exhibition of British genius as its main attraction. The new developer has very different views. Millions are being spent on rides. The theme is no longer the best of British, but the American West. It'll take several months to change the scenery, but the new sheriff has already been installed. Having watched KLF's managing director bite the dust, the council leader has been appointed chairman of the new project. In April, Britannia Park will be reborn as the American Adventure, a huge theme town. But as Kellard and Bookbinder go their separate ways, it's clear that it's a town which wasn't big enough for both of them.